Uh, my name is Sharon Alexander. I'm the new executive director of the Carbon County Community Foundation. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for all Carbon County residents now and forever. We work with donors to create legacies of giving for the local causes that matter the most to them. Uh, we help donors invest in nonprofit organizations with strategic grants and lead our community to a better future. This event is usually held each year in person to connect people from Carbon County's nonprofit, government, and professional sectors. Uh, but because 2020 has been so different from normal and at times a little challenging, uh, we sent out a survey a couple weeks ago to find out what it is that you all want to discuss, learn, and explore in the virtual space during this year's event. So the sessions that we have lined up for the week are based on those responses. We really wanted to make sure that we were providing the content that you were looking for. Um, so if you weren't able to tune in for any of the programs earlier this week, they have been recorded. So you'll still get the chance to listen. Um, all registrants, uh, regardless of whatever program you chose, will receive an email next week, week with a link to the recordings. So you can listen on your own. Um, if you have any colleagues that are interested in any of these programs, but they weren't able to, to tune in or anything like that, um, they can register or just contact me and I'll make sure that they receive those recordings as well. I would like to recognize and thank our sponsors whose generosity has allowed us to offer the program for free this year. Uh, their logos are on the screen. We rely on the support of community partners like these and just really appreciate their generosity. I also want to recognize and thank United Way for their partnership and collaboration for this event and lots of other things that we do throughout the year. A few housekeeping notes before we get started with the program. Earlier this week, registrants should have received via email a copy of the Nonprofit Forum Program Book and the Resource Guide. Uh, this document contains a schedule for the week, uh, program descriptions, and speaker bios. There's also a list of resources that might be helpful to you after this week, just some things to check out. I know um, on the page for this presentation, opposite of that, there is a handout that Kurt and his team provided in advance, so just some, uh, like a supplemental document for this program. You should have also received a copy of the Carbon County State of the Child and Family Report. This document is produced by annually by the Carbon County Collaborative, formerly the Carbon County Interagency and Family Collaborative Board. It has statistics and demographics specific to Carbon County, so it's a nice tool as you're, as you're looking at information about the county and, and all that. I'll upload both of these documents into the chat box for you to download in case you didn't receive the email. You should have been automatically muted when you entered the room. We ask that you keep yourself on mute when you're not talking, um, but we want this to be interactive. So if you have a question or a comment, just feel free to unmute yourself. You can also use the chat box. We'll be watching that. Today's program is alternative fundraising, pivoting away from in-person events. Um, I personally have a lot of experience with special events and I'll tell you, they can be fun and they're a great way to get a lot of donors in the room at one time, but they are also a ton of work and sometimes are not always worth the financial return. So I hope that this program helps you think outside of the box and other ways you might be able to fundraise for your organization, especially now. Our speaker is Kurt Bowman, Executive Director of the Nonprofit and Community Assistance Center. For the last 30 years, Kurt and his team have been supporting, connecting, and inspiring the region's nonprofit organizations through capacity building programs and direct consultations. NCAC is a 501c3 nonprofit affiliate of NEPA Alliance, a regional community and economic development agency serving the seven counties of Northeast Pennsylvania, including Carbon, Lackawanna, Luzerne, Monroe, Pike, Schuylkill, and Wayne. So, Kurt, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to share uh, my PowerPoint presentation here. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Sharon, thank you so much for the kind introduction and for working with us as a great partner. Um, a little backdrop, we are very proud uh, at NEPA Alliance and at NCAC to have been a, a, one of the founding partners for the Carbon County Community Foundation. Uh, about five years ago, we leveraged some federal dollars 
to help form the foundation. We worked with Tina Dowd and, and the great board members that are on the foundation to uh, basically come up with the mission, the logo, the legal documentation, everything needed to get the foundation up and running. Uh, we worked with Amber Briner, their first executive director, and now we're excited to work with Sharon and to continue the torch with her to make uh, your foundation everything it needs to be for your community. Uh, as Sharon mentioned, you know, our primary role and focus is to help nonprofits become stronger and independent. Uh, we want to build your capacity to make sure you're as efficient and effective as possible. And we do different programs to, to help those in need. Uh, the biggest things we help with, uh, you know, we do do workshops, we do customized trainings for boards and nonprofits. But our, our strongest connection is really connecting nonprofits with funders, corporate sponsors, donors, uh, and, and all types of opportunities to raise money. Uh, today's presentation is the first that we're doing in this world, uh, and, and we've learned a lot from the pandemic, and I hope everybody embraces the good things that come out of bad situations, and I think that's important. Um, nonprofits have been through struggles before. Every time there's a recession, there's obviously a, a very big downturn and what we're able to do, and there's greater need. So it's, it's what we learn from the past and how we, how we use that to adapt and, and prepare ourselves for the future is hugely important. So we're excited to talk about changing and, and what we can do. Uh, you know, we really hope that this is interactive. We do hope to use the chat function uh, to, to even put down questions you, you might wanna ask, uh, but feel free to, 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 if you have a question on a specific slide, uh, we're not afraid to ask or answer that during the presentation. We will live uh, ample time at the end to do that as well. Uh, and we're here after the event to help guide as many of you in the right direction as we can. Uh, we're a membership driven organization, uh, $50 a year to join our agency. And uh, there's certain services you can get for that. And we can explain that in, in more detail at a later time. But uh, one of the biggest things we we're proud to run is the NEPA Grant Makers Forum where we connect all the foundations together three times a year for them to talk privately amongst themselves about the challenges and what they're seeing. I had a, a mini grant makers forum with some of the largest foundations uh, in the region just this week. And what I heard from them is, is kind of shocking. They're not getting the number of asks that they expected. <laughs> so for those of you uh, on the call today, I just wanted to point that out. And uh, even though we're talking about not really grant writing and grant, uh, process as a sustainable event, uh, it's still important to you know that there's opportunities that are out there and funders are actually looking for applications. So with that, we'll jump, jump into the program objectives for today. Um, again, explore and, and implement fundraising opportunities that, that do not rely on our typical in-person events. Um, you know, before we start with that, we, we really need to talk about nonprofit revenue models and what they look like. So I'll have a few slides about what revenue models are, what they look like, and a little bit of a tool that we use to help nonprofits envision the organization that they want and the funding model that they want. Again, we talk quickly about why change and adaptation is critical. Uh, those that I think uh, don't kick every fundraising program and event they have to 2021, those that adapt now and find solutions to engage donors, volunteers, and the community on what you're doing will be stronger. I think those that, that kind of take the year off and, and uh, Thank you. bless you, and those that take, take the year off and, and, and sit back, I think will uh, regret that decision. I think those that jump into it and, and make some changes now, it will be uh, hugely beneficial for them in the years to come. And again, we talked about a couple different fundraising options we, and we'll cover these in detail. We'll give some examples, we'll give some tips and we'll give some stories behind them. And uh, again, the talents on this Zoom call, I'm happy, I'm happy to be well positioned in an organization where I really get to see the whole sector as a whole and, and what the best practices are. And then we have organizations that come in that are, you know, in crisis mode. So we get to see every different aspect of the nonprofit sector. So I always say I'm, I'm in this position because of the people who share their stories with me. And I have a lot of great experience in that. And I'm proud to work with Athena Ardwig, who's on today's call. 
And Athena is a former executive director of, of a, a large organization in Columbia County. And she's got the same experience that many of you do. And the two of us together share our stories, share what we've learned, and just help facilitate discussions. You guys are the ones leading your missions. And at the end of the day, you're the ones that need to fundraise to meet your payroll, meet your mission, and serve those in need. So I really want to hear from some of the folks on the session today to talk about what they've changed, uh, what's worked, and what hasn't worked, too, at the end of the session. So I don't like putting a lot of words on slides, but the first two bear with me, okay? So in, in searching for different aspects of revenue models, I came across some information about a year ago and, and I, I bookmarked it. Um, the, we always love funding that is reliable and autonomous, right? So when we look at re reliability, there's a way to help gauge and look at your current revenues to find out which ones are reliable and ones you can count on. So to best help, I think people pivot and change, you really gotta know what you're getting into with each type of fundraiser or any type of investment that you're looking to leverage for your organization and your mission and realize that there's a cost for each one. So there's seven steps here to talk about revenue models. And the first one, again, reliability and autonomy. So if we look at the examples here, three levels of reliability um, in fundraising. So you have things like United Way support, again, the sponsor of today's program, rental income for those nonprofits that maybe are a little bit larger and have other nonprofits in their building. I think YMCAs are good examples of that because many YMCAs across the country typically have some type of physical rehabilitation uh, business or nonprofit in their building where it's a symbiotic relationship. So other nonprofits are using advertising, you know, uh, smaller individual contributions that come on an annual basis. And of course we love endowments and, and memberships because those are uh, two revenue sources that are quite reliable. And then you have medium, medium reliability. Again, um, you know, we all know that the government crunch is gonna happen, particularly at the state level, sometime between November 1 and January 1. We know the state revenue uh, is, is hurting due to the pandemic and that programs are going to suffer. Uh, so we all have, uh, many of us probably have state funds as part of our revenue pie. Uh, so we know that those are, are critical concerns for our, us right now. And then again, low reliability, uh, government project grants, ones that are, are one-offs. Uh, so many of the large funding programs that are used more liberally uh, the RACP programs, the gaming grants, many of those programs, again, are going to have less funding next year than they had this past year. And again, foundation grants and, and corporate sponsorships. Uh, you know, many corporations have, have been hurt. Many businesses have closed. Uh, foundations, uh, although the, the stock market hit wasn't too bad, you know, their future grant making may be down a little bit because of the stock market. And then let's talk about autonomy. You know, with every funding source, uh, well, I'm sorry, with most funding sources, there's, there's taskmasters, there's strings attached, there's contracts, uh, there's donor wishes, and, and all of those are important, important obligations that we have to meet in order to make our funders happy, to prove that their money is having impact, and to prove that, that the money is, is going to help solve the mission that we set out uh, to assist with. And again, under autonomy, there's three different levels here, high autonomy, uh, medium autonomy, and low autonomy. Again, the high autonomy, I think, is, is the part that we're gonna talk about today is getting organizations to pivot away from some of the typical sources and to start looking at new revenue models. Uh, so high autonomy, again, the small, medium-sized gifts uh, that are typical through an annual campaign or annual appeal or a gives day, memberships, Fees for service, the medical reimbursement for those that are healthcare providers, uh, and then foundation operation grants. Those, those typically don't have a lot of strings attached because they're meant to help organizations keep the light on during really difficult times. And I think the food pantries uh, over the last six months have been uh, huge benefactors of operating grants for many of our largest foundations because we knew as, as the unemployment levels had risen, and the access to different types of support services has dropped because of the pandemic. Uh, 
food services and Meals on Wheels programs have, have had a huge increase in usage. And then you have medium autonomy, again, major, major individual contributions, corporate charitable contributions, and, and so on. There's sometimes strings attached, or they might be funding a specific program. But all in all, in most cases, we're able to help work with somebody one-on-one -on -one to help uh, make sure the funding is going to be used that's mutually agreeable between the donor and the nonprofit. And then the, the low autonomy programs are the, are the government programs and the ones where, where sometimes the reporting on a grant isn't worth the actual money that the grant is providing. Um, and some foundation projects in some way, United Way, even for small, small sources, sometimes uh, I've had organizations who stepped away from the United Way funding because there is an effort uh, and, it, and it's accountability is important, but sometimes the accountability and effort doesn't match uh, the typical size of, of, a, of a worthy grant or contribution. So some other, other aspects of revenue models that we have to consider before any of you look at some of the ideas that we have presented here. Again, while many revenues are possible, not all are feasible. Every, every type of revenue source we approach will have a cost. Uh, in most cases, when we're dealing with larger donors, individual donors, it's cultivation. Uh, in order to get a five, ten, fifty thousand dollar donor, you might have to cultivate relationships with up to twenty people to narrow it down to one person who turns into a donor, and it might take three to six months to go through that process. Um, understand the cost of new revenue. Uh, each revenue stream takes time. Again, each revenue source has different task, master, task masters and accountability and also restrictions on reporting and what funding can be used for. The other thing that's important to know is, is understanding your board and staff capacity. Sometimes pivoting is important, but do you have the right board makeup and the right team for the new challenges or new opportunities you might uh, consider from a fundraising perspective? Uh, a quick example of this is grant rating versus fundraising. We all know if you're working for Geisinger, Geisinger has very, very specific rules, or I'm sorry, roles within their development staff of who's doing what. Grant writers and fundraisers are completely different types of people and have completely different skill sets. Grant writers tend to be a little bit more introverted, great with detail, great gathering information, great with research. Fundraisers, obviously, are more people that are more gregarious, people that are, are people persons, people that are more engaging and are conversationalists. And, and just from that initial standpoint, and please, you know, I, I'm, I'm categorizing here to some degree, but just using it as an example, some people may be good at both of these tasks, but it's important to, to look at what your organization has and doesn't have in certain areas before you start changing and adapting to some of the things we're gonna talk about. So again, talking about Geisinger, they have the luxury of having people who have different roles. Many of our colleges and universities and healthcare systems do. Us smaller organizations, we don't. Therefore, we have to rely on uh, board expertise, more volunteer expertise, uh, and maybe there's program staff that can do a little bit of both. And lastly, when, when to use consultants in certain roles too is, is crucial. Uh, sometimes it's best when you're starting a new type of fundraising endeavor, you will use a consultant to draw on their experiences and best practices to help you change and adapt into the future. Um, and again, campaigns. Campaigns are not just for capital. Uh, more and more organizations are starting to use campaigns for programmatic expansions, innovative program launch, when they're wrapping in the cost of human capital and technology into capital campaigns to give the full cost of certain programs. Uh, capital campaigns, I, I think, are successful because it's easy to see the rewards of the process. When you need a new facility, a new wing, uh, anything that's new that's necessary for the community to make your community stronger, and it's, when it's visible, it's obviously easy for don donors to connect to. And it's even easier for those donors who are looking for some type of recognition, whether it's corporate uh, uh, donors who might want their name affiliated with the, a nonprofit. Um, so it's easy, but more and more groups are starting to use campaigns to better launch 
new programs, services, and to use it in a way that's, that's more like a, a annual appeal, but to use it for launching new initiatives or expanding current initiatives. So number five, again, is obvious. A lot of us probably have ideas that we haven't put, put or committed to paper. Uh, so as you leave today's program, and as you think about your future and, and where you think uh, there's opportunities for raising resources for your organization, it's critical that you, you, you document it. Um, and I think I, if I had a guess, uh, you know, in most audiences and workshops that we do, the number of organizations that have had a strategic plan completed in the last three years is probably 20% in most of the workshops we would do. Most folks are pushing those plans to five, six, seven years because of how much time and expensive. I would challenge groups that in the same capacity, if you have a strategic plan and a fundraising plan, you will set yourself higher than most organizations that are coming to community foundations and other foundations looking for funding or to individual donors. Uh, that the whole point of putting this re revenue model or fundraising plan together is not just for you, but it's to impress those you're looking to seek donations from. Again, every funder wants to see a plan and every funder wants to see how you're gonna achieve your plan. So your strategic plan is what you're gonna do, your revenue model, your fundraising plan is how you're going to get there. And you really can't have one without the other. So again, I would challenge you guys, it doesn't have to be elaborate, but strategic plans are much shorter these days. They're typically more dashboard oriented plans and, and they're easier to evaluate, but please have a, a revenue model or a fundraising plan that complements each one of the pieces so that they work hand in hand. And again, six again is obvious. Communicating a revenue plan is essential. Talking to your funders, talking to your board, talking to your closest allies uh, and, and donors about what you plan to do and what your long-term uh, objectives are. And then lastly, just like anything we do, you know, we implement, we monitor, we evaluate, we adapt. Um, performance and accountability are, are critical. Uh, first, we, we need to do these things for us. Uh, we, we cannot uh, intelligently try to serve our mission without trying to evaluate how we're doing. And even though funders are the ones that typically put the biggest burden on us with this, we need to have our own base load of information or benchmark of information are ready to be able to understand it. And lastly, I put here, fail fast, fail cheap. Uh, this is a concept that I've learned in a leadership program at NeighborWorks America. Launching new programs, launching new initiatives, last, uh, launching uh, even a new department or a person within your organization is expensive, time consuming, and it doesn't always work. The fail fast, fail cheap concept is, 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 is simply this. When you're trying something new, make sure you have a way to evaluate it quickly so that if you make an investment that doesn't work out, that you quickly pivot away from it. And, and you know, many organizations I've worked with in the past have hired a development person for the first time and they got somebody who did, wasn't a good fit. And if you're able to adapt rather quickly um, and again, having, having open discussions with, with team members and staff members and having, um, you know, evaluation periods with new staff uh, and even with consultants, making sure that the relationship is going to work long time is important. But, but also recognizing that failure is okay if it's recognized early and dealt with and then you change or pivot in, into a new direction afterwards. It's the fail fast and, and then the long-term repercussions from not dealing with a failure and sharing that failure with, with board and, and uh, other, pre other donors. Funders actually appreciate failure stories because it opens your relationship with them to a new level of honesty and accountability. So it's really tough for us to get to where we wanna go without a roadmap or what we would want our organization to look like. So there's a from to analysis. 
I'm blessed to be part of a nonprofit leadership program at the University of Scranton. Uh, each year we have a cohort of, of anywhere from 12 to 16 uh, nonprofit leaders from across the region that, that participate in the uh, one year program. And in that program, we teach several different tools to nonprofit leaders, local nonprofit folks that want to go on to become a senior management or executive director of a nonprofit locally into the future. Our goal of the program is to develop a deep bench of nonprofit leaders who want to take over uh, organizations locally because we anticipate a high level of retirements over the next five to seven years. One of the tools we teach in this class is from two. So if we look at these two pie charts, we're looking at the top left first. Uh, obviously you can see an organization here is heavily dependent on federal and state grants at 75% and events at 10%. We often, Athena and I, will often get calls from organizations like this in 2008 and 9 after the housing crisis. We had many organizations come to us and saying, we're losing money, our state grants aren't coming through, they've been drastically cut, what do we do? Typically when they're coming to us, they're coming to us too late. There's not a lot we can teach them to do because they're not ready. Their board isn't made up, their staff isn't made up, and they haven't laid any groundwork to start looking at new fundraising opportunities. So in order to get to where people are going, we look at different revenue models, again, taking some of what we learned in the previous few slides and say, we would obviously want to get more revenue sources and to look at different, more autonomous revenue and sustainable revenue. So as you can see, we, we pushed an organization and we're saying, can an organization go from year one, where they are now, five years later to the lower right-hand chart and, and, and to a new more autonomous and more diverse funding fundraising model. One of the things that, that is cautioned about uh, fundraising is not to get too diverse too early because each source has different needs and requirements. So you're, you're, you're trying to add in layers of this pie chart and these revenue sources one at a time to make sure they're working and that they continue to be feasible. Meaning the cost of raising the money is worth the end result. So the, the rule of thumb, geez, from 10, 20 years ago is that if you did an in-person event, if you didn't net $10,000, uh, typically the event wasn't, wasn't a huge success. Uh, so if you were doing a golf tournament or a gala or any event like that, the, the rule of thumb used to be $10,000 net would be required. But many of us know that the staff time going into those is sometimes nearly the cost of what we make. There is goodwill, there is volunteer engagement, there is future donor cultivation from those events, but let's, let's take an opportunity because we can't do those in events anymore. Can we get to a place where an annual appeal or online fundraising or crowdfunding opportunities will actually make it easier for us to raise money, give us more flexibility with that money, and not need the in-person events as much into the future. So we're, we're encouraging and challenging people to say, if your model looks like this, envision what you think it could be. Work with your board, work with your development staff, work with some key allies to talk about how you can get from here to here. And hopefully today's presentation gives you a little bit of insight on how to do that. So again, why, why now, why change? So in looking for inspiration in, in, in this topic and some of the things I just went out to the web and said, Hey, you know, what are, what are we hearing from nonprofit leaders and, and what are the, the critical roles that we serve and, and why now, uh, why after a housing crisis in 08 or after a pandemic now, or after a, a recession uh, back in the, in the 1990s, why, why are we needing a change? So I, I found, a couple of quotes here. This is Adam Grant from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. We also run the Center for High Impact Philanthropy. One of the ways we can cope with uncertainty is when we, when you can't imagine the future, you could actually rewind and think more about the past. So here we are in a pandemic. This is different than any recessions most of us have ever seen because we don't really know how gloomy 2021 is going to be yet. We don't know when the vaccine's coming. We don't know how, wet, how bad the state and federal budgets will be. 
Uh, we all know we have an election that's, that's right at the forefront. So there's a ton of uncertainty. So it's a time for us to reflect in the past, you know, recognize the hardships uh, that we're faced with before and learn what did we do in 2009 after the housing crisis? What of those lessons we learned can we apply now? And what might work today? And then this next quote here, again, this is from Board Source. And, and this is just a, a feel good. Hey, we as a sector are hugely crucial. Uh, we're gap fillers. We do the things that government and business doesn't do in our society. And, and again here, this quote is, we recognize the enormity of the responsibility that sits on our shoulders of nonprofits and their boards at this moment. This is true for nonprofits providing direct services to vulnerable populations but also organizations that may be working on issues less directly connected to serving vulnerable populations. We all are part of this fabric of, of, of uh, services and programs we offer our community, offer to our communities and, and to those in need. So in, in some ways, I feel the nonprofit sector is most readily adaptable to change and to solving problems that we didn't have six months ago. So with that, you know, we'd like to jump into uh, what we think it's necessary to do to pivot. You know, first, becoming a fearless fundraiser. Uh, let's face it, if you're on this call today and you have a fear of asking uh, for donations or making big asks to donors, you're probably not in the right position. The other question is, is the team around you, your board, your staff, comfortable with making that? Um, there's a book uh, named 50 Ask in 50 Weeks by an author and fundraising consultant. Her name is Amy Eisenstein. Uh, she's in New Jersey. She's come here and present multiple times in the past. But I've always loved her book and how the simplicity of the name is important. How many folks on today's call could think of 50 people that they could write down on, on a list that they would be able to go and have coffee with once a week or have a Zoom meeting with once a week be able to ask them for a relevant donation to your organization. And what do, I, what do I mean by relevant? Well, if you're an all volunteer organization and not being paid, maybe your relevant donation is $100. Or maybe it's looking for someone to join annually to your organization. If you're a paid executive director and, and, and in the middle space of that nonprofit world from three employees up to 50 employees, maybe that ask is $1,000. But how many folks today could say, do I have 50 people in my Rolodex to be able to schedule 35, 40 minutes with a major donor to talk about a specific individual need we have and looking for their support. So sometimes just making a, a conscious effort to schedule time with people and donors is crucial. As I noted at the beginning of the session, funders are looking for projects. Um, I think the biggest thing when I'm on calls with funders Funders are saying, why aren't people asking? And I keep explaining, here we are, in, we're, we're in the eye of the storm. Um, and, and some people don't like calling the pandemic a storm because storms are typically quick events. Uh, this, is, this is more like an ice age as it relates to a storm because this is going to have two to, two to five years of direct um, economic challenges. There's gonna be many businesses that go out of business many nonprofits that fail and, 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 and things that we haven't seen from past recessions. So when funders say, geez, we're not getting asked, my challenge to them is Athena and I have received 20 to 30% more calls and emails during the pandemic than previous years. And I would challenge the funders and say, well, I need more people, but a 75,000 capacity building grant does nothing more than put a burden on my plate, fund somebody for a year that I have to train, and then I have no solution to keep that person long-term. So in most cases, and I think most of you would agree, nonprofits are looking for revenue models, sources of money that are easy to maintain and have more of a long haul. I tell funders all the time, I want to build our organization for the long-term to not rely on grants. We're fortunate that we own a building and have rental income. And we're fortunate for a few annual contributions that have been 
quite regular and highly autonomous. But for funders who said to, to me, Kurt, why don't you apply for funding to build capacity asset? Instead of a $75,000 grant, I would rather a $25,000 grant for five years to be able to hire somebody part-time or to build existing capacity or a consultant bench that might be able to bring in some talents that Athena and I don't have to work with nonprofits. So I think many of you would agree with some of those, those circumstances. And then the other thing is to use your closest donors as leverage. I'm sure many of you had donations or calls to provide funding in the middle or at the early stages of this crisis from, from, from key allies, board members, and donors. And I hope, I hope that that's the case. So how do you take those donations and capitalize and leverage them for good? So in many cases, it's, it's, it's important to use those key contributors for other events or to make them challenge grants. And again, we'll talk about some of those things in the next few slides. So developing a fundraising strategy, again, we have to proper, properly articulate our needs and services uh, and, and what, what we're asking for of funders and how it relates to our vision and mission. Identify funding types and sources that align with various uh, services and programs. And again, that's more on the grant side. Diversification is good. The more different types of donors helps us build resiliency. And every type of economic downturn that comes, we become more resilient with the more revenue streams that we have. That said, again, I've been on multiple, involved with multiple organizations and multiple funders who do turn away funding. That is, is not a perfect mission fit and funding that is, is, has high costs to maintain and is not very reliable. And I think uh, the organizations I speak to are typically community development organizations who turn away from city or county CDBG projects because those programs aren't sustainable, have high reporting requirements, high cost to getting those funds, uh, and many hoops you have to jump through. And develop sustainability related to funding. Again, developing corporate alliances. How do we get corporations to, to align with our mission and ones that make sense? And then obviously considering social enterprise. Social enterprises is the holy grail of fundraising because if you could find the right social enterprise where things work together, you're probably developing some type of funding source that's gonna eventually turn into something that's pretty steady and autonomous for a long period of time. The oldest social enterprises are obviously Goodwill and the Salvation Army. I also am on the pleasure of being on NeighborWorks uh, Northeastern Pennsylvania's board. We have a property acquisition and redevelopment program. It's called PAR, where we purchase blighted properties at share sales. We invest, uh, we have a pool of money that we invest in those properties uh, relatively quickly, get them back on the market, and we make profits on those properties, flipping houses. It's a little easier for a nonprofit to do those things because Nonprofits typically don't have to pay the property tax and we have a pool of money where we're able to use quickly and turn the property around quicker than most developers and contractors. The perfect part about that social enterprise is it's threefold. One, it's mission driven. We're, we're completing projects that are typically on a blighted street, or I'm sorry, on a street where there's one blighted property. And by fixing that one blighted property, we're raising the value of all the houses on that street. The minute we fix that property and sell it, we send a donation request to each one of the houses on that block saying, we solved the problem, we hope you're happy with it, and we hope that you will consider donating to us because we think our value uh, is helping you and helping our community get stronger. The second piece to that is it raised money that we can use in other areas. And then the third piece is we're taking and solving a government problem. Cities and counties struggle with blight and, and blighted properties that aren't on the tax roll. It costs a lot of money to go to foreclosure. So we're helping make that burden of government easier by reducing those issues and taking the challenge on ourselves. Okay. So the first type of pivot, our first option to pivot is 
is a, a day of giving. And again, everybody who's affiliated with a, a, an education institution, a higher education institution is probably very familiar with giving, giving days. Again, they're typically 24 to 48 hour fundraising campaigns. And again, it's, it's really designed uh, for so, around social media. You know, it's designed to create buzz, excitement, raise lots of money and to make sure everybody has fun. It's about uh, aligning people's uh, affinity for a certain organization and what, they've, what their experience at an institutional organization is all about. Uh, so it's, it's, it's used to incite and engage your donors. And again, many of those donors that are giving during giving days turn into long-term donors and also become leaders, lead gift providers. So again, this is University of Scranton's virtual uh, run walk on May 6th. This is a, from a few different years ago. And again, their giving day has lots of different ways for people to be involved. And you can see they have affinity groups all over the country. And they use this giving day to excite their alumni base, to find future donors and volunteers, and to allow people different ways to give and participate with being a member of the University of Scranton family. So what other giving days are there out there? So let me talk about NEPA Gives. Uh, NEPA Gives is the first Friday in June. Uh, last year, uh, this past June was the first NEPA Gives Day. Uh, NCAC was a sponsor and a partner of, of NEPA Gives Day. And uh, we helped some of our rural uh, community foundations participate. Uh, there's also Giving Tuesday. Again, uh, typically the, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, um, after uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday, uh, Thankfully, someone in our sector came up with the idea that in a day where we're purchasing gifts for family and friends uh, in preparation for our winter holidays, uh, that Giving Tuesday came about as, hey, don't forget those who don't have what we have. Uh, even though we're giving to others and, and providing uh, you know, a strong role in our community and our families, let's not forget about the organizations who are struggling uh, particularly during holiday seasons when there's typically higher needs. And then affinity days. Again, these are days that are, are, are specifically tied to a cause, an organization. So here's a couple of examples. National Philanthropy Day is, is typically held a week before Thanksgiving and it's part of the Association for Fundraising Professionals. And this is a day where they honor different foundations, donors, and different groups. Uh, then there's the Ca Captain Planet Foundation. Uh, this foundation raises money to engage students in STEM-related Earth Day activities, things that will bring sustainability and, and uh, uh, renewable energy type initiatives to the forefront. So they use Earth Day as their giving day for the Captive Planet Foundation. They raise money. They use that money to give out to schools and other educational nonprofits to encourage kids to come up with solutions for our biggest environmental issues. American Red Cross has a giving day. Um, Race for Education, many of our schools have used this program uh, over the years as a, a pledge for students to uh, complete a race on, on, a, on a field day at their school. Uh, the concept for Race Education came out of um, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. There's a consultant in there, his name is Jim Coles, who, who developed a for-profit business to help schools with fundraisers like this. Um, and the, the fundraisers designed to get each grade level to compete um, for the best they can themselves, the number of laps they can complete, either walking or running on a certain day, and that family and friends donate to each child for them to uh, commit uh, to completing a certain uh, number of, of laps that day. Uh, the cool part about that is, is it brings schools and their families together around certain causes. And many schools use that race for education or technology or STEM related activities in their schools. Um, so the race for education, we're planning on potentially doing a, uh, potentially doing a webinar with, with Jim Coles on how that program works and the platform. Obviously they charge as a for-profit, they charge a fee, a percentage of, of revenue from the fundraising day, uh, but their platform is really strong and really slick and it works well. Uh, they, don't they don't 
they don't make a lot of money on these events. Uh, and, and I'm certain that they're doing it from the goodness of their heart, but they're making a living at it too. So a little bit more on NEPA gives. And before today's test session, I did talk to Sharon about it. Uh, Sharon was newly uh, hired by the Carbon County Community Foundation. So carbon wasn't a part of the program last year. Uh, the foundation does not need to be a part of the program, but I know Sharon uh, is considering it for next year. And again, it will likely be the first Friday in June but it's a 24 hour giving campaign with all types of prizes and incentives for organizations to raise money. So in 2020, uh, the, the day raised $534,000 in 24 hours, 167 uh, nonprofit organizations benefited and, and there was over 2,700 donors in that one day. Again, aside from raising money, you could expand community outreach, bring you new volunteers, bring you new exposure. Uh, and, and get you donors that you didn't know existed. Um, again, I participated at, for NeighborWorks as a board member on that day. Uh, NCAC was a host. We were not raising money for ourselves. Uh, the cool part about the day is that uh, organizations uh, rallied many of the donors that are close to them and used those donors to attract new donors. And, and I know Athena and I both gave to multiple organizations that day, organizations I didn't plan to give to initially. And it's a pretty cool process. The, the nice part is many of the community foundations came up with cool incentives. So uh, one of the examples is uh, the first five organizations to raise $1,000 got a $1,000 match. So at NeighborWorks, five of our board members rose at 11.59, made uh, donations to, to, to get to 1,000, and we received a $1,000 match. Overall, uh, we, be, we came, I think, in third place in fundraising efforts out of 167 organizations and we leveraged six bonuses that day to get to that place. Uh, so it, it, it takes a lot of work. We're actually working on some curriculum to help nonprofits plan for that day next June. Um, so it, it's it, the word I used when, when asked to describe it was euphoric. It was fun to participate. It was fun to see so many people uh, sharing and giving. Uh, and, and the way I looked at it is, you know, uh, it goes back to that fearlessness about asking. Uh, I was able to be prepared that day to send a custom text to friends and family asking for the minimum donation of $10. One of our goals was to be the, have the organization with the most individual donors. So I, I texted, which I think is more personable than an email, as many friends and, phone and, and family as I in, in my contact list, which again was probably a couple of hundred. And, and I also texted some of the nonprofit friends I've helped throughout the years. And through those text messages, uh, I'm certain that uh, 20 to 30 of the donors for NeighborWorks that day came from that. That personal uh, type of touch was hugely critical. So we're hoping that uh, Sharon and her board and her team will participate next year. The key, uh, the, let, me, let me note that they do not need to participate for you to participate. Any organization in the region can join NEPA Gives, use the platform. Uh, I think it's a $20 entry fee for you to join the platform to raise money and use it as a platform for good. So what, what about giving days if you were to start your own or to, to challenge uh, you know, your board to do something on your own or to be part of NEPA, NEPA Gives Day? So how do you get started in something like this? So first we talk about choosing dates, you know, setting goals, what you're looking to raise and for what, what what's the purpose of the funding? You know, having a title or a tagline or a theme is, is, is crucial. Uh, rallying support you know, getting board, key volunteers, key donors. So I talked again about earlier this year, if, if perhaps some of you received checks you didn't expect, can you use some of that rallying support to leverage more money? Uh, for NeighborWorks, I know our board raises, uh, you know, as a board somewhere around uh, two to $3,000. And instead of giving that in our annual campaign every year, we now give it on NEPA Gives Day because the $3,000 is more impactful. And then planning your communications. How do you share the message about getting people excited about participating in that day? And, and 
you know, making sure you're, you have the right volunteers who are willing to share stories with family and friends. Again, teamwork is a huge part. Uh, getting as many colleagues and volunteers as you can and those that believe in the mission. Better yet, if you have clients who've benefited from your programs or services and using those clients uh, to be part of that day. Uh, I'm not sure many of you have, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of Discover NEPA, uh, which is a website and, and social media platform that really highlights many of the beautiful uh, things we, we treasure and value in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Discover NEPA was developed by Miracle Corporation, uh, Rob Miracle, who obviously is one of the largest land developers in the region, and he did it to highlight our region's uh, attractiveness to the outside world. Um, and it does so in many different ways. It also highlights our nonprofits. Uh, there's many videos on there that are produced by Discover NEPA for nonprofits. So if you were going to participate in NEPA Gives Day, you might be able to get a free video from uh, Mary Kolasar, who runs that group, uh, to see if you can get a video customized for NEPA Gives 2021. Uh, ownership from your bigger fan, getting people to commit to raising a certain amount of money and a certain amount of donors. It's another crucial aspect of getting uh, work done on a day that's going to benefit your organization. A variety of outreach. Again, this is crucial. You're going to have donors of all different types of technology sophistication, use different methods to speak to all generations. Uh, even during NEPA gives, many organizations receive checks two, three, four days after the event for those who chose to give in a different way. So using email, using mail, uh, and using other other media is still important, not just the social media platforms. Visual content, again, having videos, uh, having testimonials, having client stories is critical to helping engage people to understand what you do and your role in the community. Uh, be louder than, than usual. It's okay to, to hit people up two or three times in one day during a major event. People understand, uh, I think, and get it. When, when, when a gives day comes around, um, expect to be contacted multiple times. And, and donors expect it, um, and, and those affiliated with the organization expect it. And then lastly, this is common sense. It's obviously easier for the institutions and hospitals and health systems to make it easy. You know, making, making mobile giving, fundraising as easy as possible uh, is critical to your success. Um, one thing Athena and I will also one thing Athena and I will also note is that uh, is once you receive new donors, is keeping them. Um, so again, urgency with the story. Um, emphasize how funding is needed now more than ever, and have a reason, a cause, a story behind uh, why it's important that your mission continue. Dream big. Listen, if you're not going to set goals that are, that are uh, hard to reach, you're not pushing your board, your volunteers, and your donors, donors hard enough. And then lastly, like I said, be sure to thank those who give. Engage those donors. And if you can engage a donor from year one to year two, you have a 70% chance of retaining those donors for 10 years. Uh, the more you engage somebody in year one, and have, have that piece of the story ready. Uh, again, as Athena and I noted, we gave to multiple groups on NEPA Gives Day. Some organizations sent thank yous immediately. Some organizations called. Some organizations, we got personal notes. Some organizations asked us for money six months later. All of those are pieces to the puzzle, making sure your story, how you want to be recognized as an organization, and how you thank people is critical, uh, just as critical as any other part of the day. And it's much easier to retain a donor than it is to find a new donor. So keep them happy. So for organizations out there that are heavily grant funded, uh, we think it's important for people to pivot. One of the things we, slides we show in our grant writing workshops is we have a huge pie chart of the billions of dollars given or donated 
each year to nonprofit organizations. Overwhelmingly, 75% of all donations to nonprofits come from individuals. And the portions that come from grants, uh, foundation grants, corporations, and bequests are a much, much smaller subset in that 22 to 25%. I'm sorry, uh, uh, really 19 to 23%. So if your organization does not have some type of individual annual giving, individual appeal, membership appeal, chances are it's going to be very tough for you to sustain your organization just with grants. So, and again, an annual giving is a strategically planned series of activities uh, designed to establish and nurture a broad base of donors uh, to help fulfill your mission. So this type of appeal is designed to reach out those who are closest to you. Most appeals happen you know, near the holiday season and it's designed to give you the most flexible funding possible to achieve your mission. And new organizations, this is a struggle. This is a struggle to find the right people to get the right people engaged. Social media makes it easier than ever, uh, but, but it's, it's still critical. Okay. So with annual appeals, again, it's not much different than a giving day. You're still telling your story um, and, and intertwining your mission with people you've held. You want to be able to provide facts and data, but to support those facts and data with an individual story of a client who's benefited from your programs or services. Facts and data will speak to some people and sometimes emotion will speak to others. Donors have different triggers. Tip two, demonstrate you, your board, your staff is passionate about what you're doing. Um, organizations who have boards that are not contributors or donors or not askers typically aren't the strongest organizations in the community. Boards must lead by example. Boards must be the first ones in. They must be 100% in. And, and we're not getting to amounts. I, I don't need board job descriptions that say, hey, you have to bring in a minimum of $1,000 or give a minimum. That's not the important part. The important part is that they're giving. The other key tip here is making specific asks. Give donors options. Uh, you can't just put out a appeal letter, letter without specifically putting in the first paragraph that you are asking for a donation. And the more options you give, the better chances are you'll receive something from them. And by giving options, you're giving options of when to give, ways to give. You want to give a one-time gift, monthly gift, recurring gift. The more options, the better. The other thing about options, too, is making people feel like giving to your organization solving a specific problem. A lot of organizations will use different uh, clip art or icons to talk about, you know, $50 a day will provide five meals to students for our summer camp program or uh, you know, weekly meals to five students for our summer camp program and break down how the value of that donation uh, solves a problem within the mission. Share testimonials and client stories. Having clients as part of the pitch. Uh, these are all great tactics. Being honest. Uh, sharing the fact that nonprofits do struggle uh, pandemics and, 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 and recessions are, are uh, this is a, a new situation. Uh, where we're all learning to adapt. Be honest about your challenges. Be honest about uh, how difficult it might be to not be able to have team meetings and have gatherings the way we used to. Uh, that does play a toll on us psychologically, physically, and, and in all that we do. And again, making it easier for people to, to, to donate, making it easier for people to give and follow up. Same thing at the end of, of a gives day, you're going to, your best bet is to personalize your follow-ups as much as possible. For annual appeals, if you have five donors or, or, or 100 donors, those organizations that have personalized type of follow-up is critical to keeping those people engaged for the long haul. So option three, crowdfunding. You know, crowdfunding has this, another specific role within organizations. 
Uh, you know, it's about raising a small amount of money for a large number of people uh, to showcase very, very specific projects. Um, something that people can envision and manage quite quickly. Uh, asks are very concise, you know, have a great story, have a great backdrop, uh, very specific time frame. Usually they're done for quicker initiatives or, or, or needs that are eminent. Um, I think some of the examples here, animal shelters. Animal shelters right after a major uh, story of animal cruelty or some type of very sad situation in the animal world, uh, you'll see animal shelters will often put out a story about what happened, how their organization intervened and, and took ownership and the livelihood of an animal that was neglected or harmed, and they will turn that into a crowdfunding platform to raise money for that individual animal so it can get the care and treatment it needs. They use it quite effectively, and it, it solves an immediate fundraising need for something that's going to be highly expensive for them to get the right care for. Food banks do it. Uh, again, they share client stories. They talk about individual needs. They talk about unemployment levels. Uh, the other types of things that are typically used for crowdsourcing are individual type needs. If your organization helps people with physical challenges, uh, physical needs, so using, uh, helping somebody get a van if they have a physically challenged individual uh, helping people recover from a fire, or perhaps putting in a new memorial, a war memorial, or something in a park or a playground, something that's visual, where you want a lot of community buy-in, but you want small amounts of money from a lot of different people. So crowdfunding has its role. and can be used quite effectively in different organizations for different needs. Uh, my children attend a, a small private school, uh, grade school, and they had uh, the benefit of getting new Chromebooks a few years ago, and uh, lo and behold, uh, Chromebooks and iPads, lo and behold, they did not have enough charging stations. So we suggested a crowdfunding uh, platform to raise money for a, a, a charging cart that would allow 20 to 30 uh, devices to be charged at one time quite quickly so that it could be used from class to class to class. Uh, Writing a grant for something that might be $2,500 wasn't worth it. It was needed relatively quickly. It was a challenge that wasn't, wasn't seen in advance. And it was a great success to be able to raise, I think we raised $3,000. Not only did we get the chart, they also bought additional uh, covers and cases for the tablets to protect them with some of the additional proceeds from that crowdfunding platform. So lots of different ways to use that platform and it has a different role within our organizations. So again, and this is nothing new, you, you know, we all consume media, whether it's channel 16, uh, news stations or social media, lots of different ways to raise money. And there's different examples here, you know, talking about channel 16, you have Ryan's run, engaging runners to, to run locally in marathons, virtual races. And, and then some of those runners are not only able to, to participate in the local run, some of them are elevated to run into some larger marathons in New York and Boston. Uh, the Northeast, Northeast Cancer Institute has always had a gaming night, uh, a board game night that would raise money for uh, colorectal cancer screening and so on. Trivia nights have been very popular during the pandemic for people to engage and using those trivia nights as fundraisers. Uh, Roundup is, a, is a, another uh, new platform where many corporate partners are allowing uh, nonprofits to raise money by having those in retail locations round up their purchases to the nearest dollar and using those cents to go to various nonprofit organizations. Um, during the pandemic, again, takeout has been a, a big part of all of our lives because of our inability to go out to eat. So people have been leveraging that opportunity uh, through Shopify, Grubhub, and other platforms to raise money for nonprofits. And then the unevents, uh, events where really there's no overhead other than the fact we're talking about, we have a cause, we can't have an event, but we're asking you to participate out of solidarity. Uh, a lot of different ways to, to, to use these unevents to engage people, to make them feel good, and to know that almost all of their money or contribution is going to the cause versus some of it going to a, call, a gala, a meal, or, or, or a fundraising type efforts. 
you know, people, again, I've seen more during the pandemic of people sharing, uh, using their birthdays, using weddings, uh, and even, even funerals to raise money for nonprofits. And I, I, I couch that with a ton of sensitivity. Uh, but there's lots of different ways to use these platforms to raise money. Um, I currently have some family members that are involved uh, that, are, that are in hospice service, each of them with different nonprofit organizations in our region. And I've already talked to family members about including those hospice support services in uh, you know, obituaries for, for family members when they, when they pass, knowing how critical and important uh, the young people who come out and, and, and provide needed services to these family members in, in their critical time of need, when they're near, near death. And I think uh, being in a nonprofit, it's easy for me to understand that, but it's important that uh, we personalize these things so that we thank those nonprofits who do fill that gap uh, to help people in need. The last example here I'll give you on an individual team event is, uh, again, part of NeighborWorks NEPA. Uh, our, our executive director, Jesse Ergot, uh, attended a conference about six years ago and, and met a group called Over the Edge. Uh, they're out of Nova Scotia, up in Canada, and uh, they were a for-profit business that did fundraisers. They did repelling adventures. Um, the goal of, uh, you know, so they, they come in and provide a repelling adventure and use that platform to raise money. Uh, we went through a six month process to evaluate it as a fundraiser for Northeastern Pennsylvania for our organization. And we said yes to it. And it was a huge expense, upfront expansion risk. Uh, we are not afraid of taking risk and, and we purchased uh, this fundraising platform for $22,000. And our goal was to raise a thousand, I'm sorry, a hundred thousand dollars on the day uh, we did it for two years. Uh, the first year we, we raised uh, 58,000, that was net. So we did get closer to the $100,000 goal. And the second year we raised 76,000. Uh, the cool part about doing something like that is we engaged tons of new donors where each donor who participated or each repeller who participated had to raise a minimum of $1,000 to repel down the tallest building in Scranton, uh, which is a 13 story building. I believe it was about 150 feet. And I was one of those fundraisers that day. This is Jesse Ergot here. This is me repelling. This is West Grant in the background, PNC Bank in the background. But it was a pretty thrilling day and something that uh, uh, I'm proud of. I'm proud of what we've done. And, and, and it was something that we didn't know we could do, but we did it as a, as a 12 portion organization. We did something that we challenged ourselves with. I will not lie that my hands sweat every time I see myself in that situation. I'm not fond of heights, but it was easy to do for an organization I care about. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open it up to questions and answers. Again, thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you for what you do for all those in need and for all the different groups and communities you serve. And, and thanks to Sharon and the Carbon County Community Foundation uh, for hosting the event. I'm very happy to be part of uh, NEPA Alliance and NCAC and I'm really happy about the region and what I do and um, happy to help any organizations achieve their mission or to just have candid conversations about what's working, what's not working in your organization. So uh, myself, Athena Ardwood are here to help. Uh, again, thank you for participating in today's event. We hope there are a few questions. Hey, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself or you can use the chat box and, and type in your question. Hello, this is Mandy Fitzpatrick from Schuylkill County's Vision. How are you? Good. Um, I have a question. You mentioned for your, the um, NEPA Gives Day that you were in the process of doing a sort of um, like a toolkit. Yes. Um, will that be useful for any community that does a Gives Day? Well, I say toolkit. I, I, I think we're going to plan a few workshops leading up to NEPA Gives Day 2021. So okay. 
for example, you know, one of the starting points organizations need to do to get prepared for a gift day is look at your donor database. See which of those donors in your database who have a propensity to give online or electronically and, and you know, using that platform to get people excited and then finding volunteers, former clients, uh, board members, those who could rally others and make commitments. You know, much like the, the over the edge event where 50 to 60 repellers all raised a thousand dollars or more, you're looking for somebody on NEPA Gives Day to make a pledge to say, listen, I'll raise X on NEPA Gives Day for Scoop Hill Vision and here's how it'll work. So these will be workshops leading up to the day. I did have a, a conversation with Amanda Campbell last year in yes. Scoop Hill. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if she's interested in participating. I think she might have been, I think Scoop Hill might have been part of another NEPA Gives Day or I'm sorry, not NEPA Gives Day, but another Gives Day. Yes, we did one. our own Gives Day um, okay. this year. It was our first one and it was, it was a fun day, um, but I'm always just looking for other resources um, as we prepare to do that one again. Sure. Um, but uh, the, the, I know the, you guys have been doing that for a few more years than, than we have. <laughs> well, well, to be truthful, it used to be called Match Day. It was a mm -hmm. matching day and then it c converted to NEPA Gives last year. So last year was the first year where it really became regional. The huge benefit to doing it regional is the, the software cost. So I'm sure, you know, Schuylkill had software costs. By having all the community foundations work together, you're bringing down the software costs to a little bit less. And uh, the other thing is, is it's easier for me. I, I'm, I'm objective. I am not Sharon. Sharon's asking for grants and funding for her, for the foundation and for endowments. But I'm able to go, and Athena's able to go, we're able to go to the large corporate funders and, and uh, family foundations and say, give us some money to incentivize nonprofits for doing good this day. And, and the reason, like the reason, somebody might say, well, listen, whether the foundation gives to NEPA gives or to a nonprofit directly, those are both good things. But mm -hmm. the purpose for foundation to give to NEPA gives as an incentive is it's encouraging us to go find our own donors and become more sustainable. Because on NEPA gives, if we all get 25 or 50 new $100 donors and we can maintain 70% of them for 10 years, that's autonomous, easy, free money that we can do for any part of our mission. So the, the, the goal for NCAC is to go to some large funders and say, please give us 50,000 so that all of our counties will have some match to share with you guys that are raising money. Mm -hmm. that's the benefit I would sell to Amanda and I plan to sell. And that's what I hope Sharon and her board by working together as a region, it's a lot easier to sell that story and sell that piece. You know, I, I used to think it was a little cruel that a funder would say, here's a thousand dollars, go find a thousand. Now I understand that we can't rely on a grant multiple years in a row. We can mm -hmm. rely on 25, hundred or five hundred dollar donors annually if we treat them the right way mm -hmm. they're going to be there in good times and bad so i think it's i think it's uh, great that school kill is doing it i'm happy to have any conversations um uh, in school kill and and keep in mind you could be part of both mandy there's nothing stopping you you just might not have to have these incentives yeah. um if there's not a lead entity you know in school kill. Mm -hmm. and you know what I, I hope that doesn't matter because i hope some of the incentives that we get are going to transcend into school kill either way. Mm. So. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, say thank you to Kurt and Athena for putting this together. Uh, we appreciate you taking your time to share some information with us today. And thank you to everyone else for joining us. and. Um, uh, sticking with us for the nonprofit forum. We have one more workshop tomorrow. Um, that one will not be recorded. So if you wanted to participate, um, make sure you tune in live for that and register. Uh, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day.